We've introduced public key cryptography, so we got to. Uh, there's an alternative to symmetric key cryptography where we use, instead of the same key at both sides, we use different keys for encrypt and decrypt. And there's really two different modes in which we use public key cryptography. One is for confidentiality, keeping our message secret, and the other mode is to use it for authentication so that we can uh, make sure that things aren't modified along the way and make sure that the person sending it is the right person. And they're very similar, except we use the keys in the different direction. So for confidentiality, we encrypt with the destination's public key and the destination decrypts with their private key. So the assumption is that to successfully encrypt and then decrypt, we must use the same keys in the key pair, but the opposite one. That is, if we encrypt with one key in the key pair, then it will only decrypt using the other key from that same key pair. If you try to decrypt with a different key, it won't work. What I mean by it won't work, we won't get the original plain text. So the idea here is that if we encrypt with the public key of B, we get some ciphertext. The only way to successfully decrypt that ciphertext is to use the private key of B. We need to use the other key in the key pair. And that's what we do for confidentiality. And why does this keep the message confidential? Well, for someone to decrypt the ciphertext, they need to know the private key of B. If it was encrypted with the public key of B, then you can only decrypt it if you have the private key of B. And there's only one person in the world that has the private key of B, and that's B. So by definition, each user has a key pair. They keep their private key private, but they can tell anyone their public key. So in this case, A, user A, knows the public key of B. It's public, you can put it on a website, you can announce it in any way you, you like. And this is confidentiality because you need the private key to decrypt. So this provides a one service. It turns out the public key cryptography is commonly used for, the, for authentication, for the alternative mode. So here what we do is the aim is not to keep the message secret. I don't care if someone sees my message. What I care about is that when B receives the message that they know it's from A. And they know it hasn't been modified along the way. So this is authentication. So what we do for this is when A wants to send a message to B, A encrypts that using their own private key. So here we use the private key of A. We get some ciphertext. We send that to B to decrypt. We use the public key of A. We must use the key or the other key in the key pair. It was encrypted with PRA. We can only decrypt with PUA. And when we decrypt, if it successfully decrypts, what does that mean? If the decryption is successful, what does that imply in this case? It's, it's right, it's verified. There's something about the private key is the and the next step, you're both correct, but what's, what's, what do we care? Why do we want to do this? Again? We want to verify that the message we got was from A. Are we sure of that? How do we know that is the case in this one? How does B know, after they decrypt this, that for sure it came from A? How do they know that? If it decrypts with the public key of A, then it implies it must have been encrypted using the private key of A. Okay, so, and there's only one person in the world that has the private key of A, it's A. So this is the, the way to check that this message must have come from A. No one else can create an encrypted message such that it decrypts successfully with the public key of A. 
because the only ciphertext that will decrypt with the public key of A is that which was encrypted with the private key of A and the only person who can encrypt something with the private key of A is A. So this is the authentication taking place of if it successfully decrypts then it confirms it was from A. It also means that uh, it was not modified along the way. So this is authentication and we'll see a small extension of this and, and this is used for what we call a digital signature. It's effectively A signing the message. A has a message to send to B, A signs the message such that when B receives that message they can confirm yes it was from A and it acts as some form of proof like your signature acts as proof on some document that it came from you. And that's one of the, the main uses of public key cryptography. So in this case, let's look what the attacker can do. Let's consider that and see, well, as a malicious user, what could we try to do to try and defeat that system? So again, we have our user A and B. Let's list the information they know, uh, what's known. For example, A has its own public-private key pair. That's the wrong... And B does as well, but we don't use B's key pair in this case. They both know the encryption and decryption algorithm. Let's be complete. They know the functions being used. And we'll list some example algorithms that are used there. So they know that. B also knows the public key of A. That's the assumption here. And in fact, that's an important assumption. That is, if A has its own key pair, that somehow it distributes the public key to everyone else. So somehow B learned the public key of A. And that's quite easy, we think. That is, all right, if I want to make my public keys public, maybe I can do is attach it to the bottom of my emails, post it on a website, print it in a newspaper, but any way that we can make an announcement. But in practice, there's an issue of, uh, and we will not discuss it yet, but there is an issue of how do you do that in a secure manner. But for now, assume B knows the public key of A. That's what's known at A and B. So the steps are that A takes the message and encrypts it with... So we start with a message and we're going to encrypt with the, pub, the private key of A, that message, and send that to B. That's what's sent. So we know the encryption algorithm. A knows its own private key. It knows the message it wants to send. It sends that to B. What does B do? When they receive, what does B do? It decrypts. So sometimes I write that as simply C, the ciphertext. B takes the steps of decrypting. So decrypt using some key C, the ciphertext received. Which key do they decrypt with? Public key of A. We decrypt the received ciphertext with the public key of A because this message came from A. We're trying to confirm, did it really come from A? And to do so, we decrypt with the public key of A. And what do we get as an output? M. It successfully decrypts. And ag again, same with symmetric key encryption, we assume we will know if it's successful or not when we decrypt. Later we'll see a more practical way to do that. But we assume that somehow anyone who decrypts knows whether the decryption was successful or not. For example, the message makes sense. 
So this is the normal approach. Let's see what the malicious user can do. So that's just the same as the slide. What if the malicious user was there? What can they try to do? And we'll, I'll draw it again, but not in full. Again, A wants to send to B. A sends C, which is equal to the encrypted message using the private key. They send that. Let's consider an attacker now. What if a malicious user intercepts and the role of the malicious user, they want to change the message or they want to... So now they want to change the message and make a modification such that B will not detect it. What can they try? The malicious user gets it before it gets to B. Can they see the message? You're the malicious user. Can you see the message? How do you see it? How do you obtain it? You decrypt this using the public key of A. So yes, you can see the message. This does not provide confidentiality. So anyone can decrypt this because the public key of A is available to everyone. So we can decrypt this. We obtain M and we know the message. What if we want to modify M to something different and then forward it on to B and with the hope that B will think it's the original message that A sent? How can we do that as the malicious user? Try. See what you can do. That is, the message comes to our malicious user and they want to obtain the message. Okay, they can decrypt, yes. And they get M when they decrypt. So they know the message. Now let's say they change it. to M prime with the aim of sending it on to B. So if they change the message and they want A to think that it, uh, sorry, they want B to think that it still came from A, then they change the message to M prime and encrypt it using what key? This is what the malicious user does. They've modified the message for their purpose and they want to send it on to B and hope that B will think it's from A. They can encrypt with which key? Any key except private key of A. So not just any key, the important point is they cannot encrypt it using the private key of A. And I think you see that because of that it won't work. So if they try to decrypt it with their own private key, for example, we try as a malicious user use our own private key, private key of the, ran out of space there, of the malicious user, if I attempt that, what happens? It arrives at B. And let's call that, uh, just to be brief, let's call that C prime. That is the message, the modified message, M prime, encrypted with the private key of the malicious user equals C prime. B does the verification steps when they receive. What does B do? B decrypts the receive message C prime 
thinking the message came from A, they decrypt with the public key of A. What happens? Right, we, when we decrypt, we somehow know that the decryption doesn't work correctly and therefore something's gone wrong because C prime was obtained by encrypting M prime with the private key of the malicious user. If we try to decrypt that ciphertext using the wrong public key, remember they're not in the same pair, then we'll assume that somehow we can detect that that decryption doesn't work. That is, we, the output we get is recognizably wrong. And that's the way for B to verify that this message is not trustworthy. We shouldn't trust it. So this is due to the fact that C prime was encrypted with the private key of the malicious user, but decrypting trying the public key of A makes B to be able to identify that that's, something's been changed. They don't necessarily know what's gone wrong, but they know something's gone wrong, and that's sufficient. Why did A encrypt with the private key of A? Because that's the, how this scheme works, to provide authentication. Uh, in this case, uh, right, two, two points. One is we assume that the algorithms, the encryption and decryption, works such that if we encrypt with one, we can only decrypt with the other in the pair. Okay, that's, that's the assumption of the algorithms. Encrypt with the private key of A can only decrypt with the public key of A. And vice versa also. In confidentiality, we saw the opposite. If we encrypt with the public key of B, we can only decrypt with the private key of B. So we assume the algorithms really can use the keys in either order. And the main algorithm, RSA, allows that. Others uh, may not, but the, the main one in use, we can swap the key order. So why did we use the private key of A? Because this is acting as some form of signature. And the, uh, the concept of a signature is the person who signs the message, they are the only person who can perform that signature. And that acts as some verification that it came from them. The only person who can encrypt with the private key of A is A. So that's one example of using public key cryptography to provide authentication. We're going to see a couple more examples, but in practice, so this is actually called a digital signature, or the concept of a signature. You encrypt with your own private key to sign a document. But in practice, we, uh, we don't necessarily encrypt the entire message. We do a modification, and instead of encrypting the entire message, maybe the message is 10 gigabytes. What can we do? don't encrypt the entire message to improve the performance, we could encrypt something else. A hash of the message. Okay, so the same concept, encrypt using your own private key, but in instead of encrypting the entire message, just encrypt a hash of the message. Because our, under our properties of hash functions, we assume that if the messages are different, the hash values are different. And we revert back to the same properties that we get with this scheme. So in fact, in practice, to sign something is to encrypt with your private key. But the way that digital signatures are used is what do you encrypt with your private key? You don't encrypt the entire message, you just encrypt a hash of the message. So we'll go to that a as an example. But you'll see it, it's effectively the same as this, except instead of operating on the entire message, just on a short part of it. That's Where is that? Uh, if we just jump forward a few slides, it's described under the section on signatures, digital signatures. 
we just looked at that concept. So the example I showed on, we calculated was the concept of a user signs a message by encrypting that message with their own private key. That's the example we just used. We talk about that. Instead of now talking about encrypting the message, we talk about signing the message. We still apply an encryption algorithm, but the, the name of the operation we talk about is signing the message. And the user can attach that signature to the message and send both. And the verification, we decrypt using the public key of the signer. That's the example we just saw. We decrypted the ciphertext using the public key of A. And then we compare and check. But in practice, the way that digital signatures work is that we don't operate on the entire message, we operate on the hash of the message. So you see the modification here is that we introduce the hash function on the message. And I think that's safe to assume from now on. When you hear about a digital signature, it means encrypting using your private key the hash of some message. And that creates a signature. So let's go through that, but we'll go through using, continuing our example and, and try and look at what the malicious user can do. Because this is a very uh, widely used application of public key cryptography, digital signatures. We'll go through it with several uh, potential attacks. So it's going to be similar to this, but now we'll introduce the hash function. Any questions before I look at the details of a digital signature? Let's go. So we'll consider first just the normal operation of the digital signature. Okay, and we have A wants to send a signed message to B. I will not write down, but again, we assume everyone has their own key pair and the other users know other users' public keys. So B knows A's public key. So we want to send a signed message to B. Let's All right, to be complete, let's write it down. Questions? We're going to do this, okay, this is the example we're going to apply where we use the hash function. But in fact it turns out it's just a simple extension of the previous one we did. Okay, I know the slides are a long way away, but the, the authentication using public key cryptography, the, the practical implementation is a digital signature, it's this. Let's write down what A knows. A knows the public key of A, of course, the private key of A. B knows the public key of A. They know the algorithms. We will not write that down, but we assume we know the algorithms. And A, a has a message to send. They want to send a signed message. For example, I have a document and when I sign a document and give it to someone, the idea of signing it is that when someone receives it, they can confirm it was from me. And maybe at a later date, they can prove to someone else that it was from me. Okay, so if you have a signed document, signed by your boss saying, here is your contract, then that acts as a form of proof that uh, that, that person agreed to it and you could use it later maybe to, to prove that yes, your, your boss did sign the contract and agreed upon your, your pay, for example. So it acts as a form of proof that it came from a particular user. 
So we have a message. What we do is we calculate the signature for that message. And to calculate the signature, we call the signature S, we encrypt using the private key of A the hash of the message. So there's the difference from our previous example. We've now introduced the hash function. Take my message, calculate a hash, encrypt that small value, especially if the message is long, the hash is usually a fixed size, hundreds of bits maybe. Encrypt that with a private key and we get our signature. What we do is we send both to B, the message and the signature. We send uh, we send the message concatenated with a signature to B. So just join them. If the message is one megabyte and the signature is 128 bits, send them uh, together. What does B do? So B wants to decrypt the signature to confirm that it matches the message. Decrypt the signature. This, the message in this case is sent in the plain, plain text, sent in the clear. So we receive S, the signature, we decrypt that. So the first step, decrypt S using what? Which key? If we think the message came from A, we must use the public key of A. We cannot use it private key of A, we don't know it. We only know the public key of A. Decrypt the signature using the public key of A. What do we get as an output? Look carefully what the hash of M should be the output. S is the hash of M encrypted with the private key of A, therefore when we decrypt we'll get the hash of M as output. I'll, I'll write it as X. And we'll, let's say we get some output called X. What do we do next at B? When we get that output, what's the next step? Remember we have a message. What we do is the next step is take a hash of that message we received. So there's two steps here. Decrypt the signature and obtain some value, let's call it X. Step two, take a hash of the message received and now compare. If the hash of the message equals X, then we're okay. That's the, the general procedure here. Compare these two values. If the decrypted signature matches the hash of the received messages, of the received message, therefore assume that everything was okay. The message verifies. If they're not equal, don't trust it. Assume the message verification failed. They should be equal, as we see, in, as long as nothing's been modified, because we expect the hash of M to come out. So X should be the hash of M, as long as nothing's modified. Therefore, X will be equal to the hash of the message. Any questions on the, the, the normal operation? This is when there's no attacker. Okay. 
Yes. All right. All right, good. Let's consider what the malicious user can do and see why this scheme works. So that to understand why it works, it's good to look. What if the malicious user tries something? What can we try? I start it again. Let's say we send a message and the malicious user intercepts. Again, we send the message concatenated with S. Our malicious user intercepts that. And like before, we try to change the message. And send it on to B. Can we do that? Can we change the message? Yes, the message is not encrypted. The message is sent in plain text, so it's easy to change it. So let's try M. Let's write it as M prime. That's the modified message. Concatenated with the signature. In this case, let's keep the same signature. So in this example, the malicious user just modifies the message. It keeps the signature as before. It's exactly the same sequence of bits in the signature. And that's easy to do because we know, for example, the signature is a certain size. So if we're using MD5, it will be 128 bits. So all we do is we take this, what's received, take the last 128 bits and attach it to our new message. What does B do? Try. Go through the steps of B verifying that message. First step, decrypt the signature. All right, X. Decrypt the signature again. We think the message is from A using the public key of A. So we decrypt the signature. We get some value X. We'll use it in a moment. The second step, take a hash of the received message, M prime. So the modified message. We don't know it's modified yet. We're trying to check. And now compare. True or false? When we compare. We compare our x, the, the value we obtain here with the hash of m prime. When we compare them, what do we get? Why are they, fo why are they not the same? Because decrypting s with the public key of a obtains hash of m because the hash of the m encrypted with the private key of a was the value of s. So x is the hash of m. We compare that with a hash of m prime. m and m prime are different. Therefore, our assumption about the hash values, they will also be different. The hash of two different messages produces two different hash values. So when we compare them, we find out they are not the same. And therefore, we've detected something goes wrong. The verification has failed, we say. B uh, knows something's gone wrong. Any questions on that attack and why it fails? So what, what will you do as a malicious user? What will you try next? 
If that didn't work, what could you try? Right. Uh, right, if we change the message, we will need to also change the signature. Because we see here, if we change the message but not the signature, B will detect that. So if we're trying to modify the message, we must also modify the signature. So let's go through it. We've seen it before, but let's uh, be complete. Just draw this one again. So again, we A sends the original message concatenated with the signature. Our malicious user intercepts, modifies, and sends it on to B. And what do they do to modify in this case? The second case, let's say they send M prime with a signature I'll denote as S prime, where S prime is calculated by the malicious user as encrypting the hash of M prime. So the malicious user finds their new message, calculates the hash, and encrypts that with what? Some private key, which is, say, the private key of the malicious user. And I think we've seen before, you know it can't be the private key of A. They, they cannot know it here. So they use some other private key. We send that on to B. B receives and tries the verification steps. And what do we do? We calculate X, decrypt with which key? The public key of A. We think it came from A, therefore we will always use the public key of A. We obtain some value x, we calculate the hash of the receive message, h of m prime, and compare. Are they equal? So we compare our obtained x with the hash of m prime, and we realize they're not equal. Why are they not equal? Because of the x in this case. That is, h of m prime was encrypted with the private key of the malicious user. When we decrypt it with the wrong key, that is, we decrypt it from a key from a different key pair, we'll get a value which is not the plain text. So the plain text was the hash of M prime, encrypted with PR of the malicious user, decrypt with the public key of A, the value X will not be the original plain text. That is, X will not be hash of M prime, which means X does not equal hash of M prime. And therefore, we've failed again. That is, the verification fails, the attack fails. So authentication has been successful in that we'd be able to detect whether something goes wrong or not. So this is because of using the wrong key here. The way for malicious user to be successful, they need to know the private key of A, which we assume they do not. The other one, which I will not draw, but is a, an extension of this, is the malicious user performing a masquerade attack. These are modification attacks where we modify something along the way. The other case is that malicious user just generates generates a message saying this is from A, sends it on. And again, the similar to this case, if malicious user creates a message, they need to create the correct signature. 
And the correct signature uses the private key of A. Because when B receives the message, they're always going to use the public key of A to verify. So the malicious user will not be able to generate a correct message without the private key of A. This scheme has an important assumption that if that doesn't hold, it all fails. And in practice, it, it may be a hard assumption to, to make true. How can the malicious user defeat this scheme? Assuming they cannot find the private key of A, how else could they try and defeat this scheme? And it happens in practice in some systems. A malicious user wants to send a message to B and B think it's from A. And when B verifies, the verification is successful and therefore the malicious user has successfully attacked. How can that work? And it comes back to our first assumption right at the top. We assume that B had the public key of A. How did B get the public key of A? Well, A posted it on his website saying, here's my public key, or sent it in an email, so announced it to the world. This, or this system fails if the malicious user can convince B that some public key belongs to A when it in fact belongs to the malicious user. So if the malicious user could convince B to think the public key of the malicious user is the public key of A, then the malicious user can do an attack. So it, it relies on the fact that B knows for sure that this public key, the sequence of bits, is in fact belonging to A. It doesn't belong to someone else. So that's an important part and a, and a hard thing to deal with in some practical systems. You receive a public key and I tell you, here's the public key of Steve. I put it on my website. How do you know for sure it's my public key? Maybe someone hacked into my website and put a public key saying this is the public key of Steve, but it's in fact a public key of the malicious user. So in fact, the way that we obtain the public key is an important uh, step in practice. For now, we assume that somehow we know it. When we look at, towards the end of the semester, we'll look at website security and digital certificates and they use these concepts of signatures and some of these problems of distributing public keys becomes important. Any last questions on signatures? Let's return to our lecture notes and see what we've missed. Jump back to public key. This topic has many different uh, subtopics. We're going to skip a few to try and finish it today so we can move on to the next topic next week. Let's review what we know so far. We have a public-private key pair and in practice each user generates their own key pair. So when you say I have my own public-private key pair, there's an algorithm for me to create those keys. They're not chosen randomly and the algorithm depends upon the, the specific implementation we're using. To use for confidentiality, encrypt with the destination's public key. Okay, you want to send a secret message to someone? you need to know their public key and you encrypt with their public key such that only they can decrypt because only they have their private key. For authentication, you encrypt with your private key because only I have my private key so it acts as proof to the receiver that the message came from me. And what we just saw with digital signatures is just an extension of this. Instead of encrypting the message in full, we encrypt a hash of the message. There are different algorithms. So what is E and D in all these steps? 
There are several different algorithms. RSA is the most widely used one. It's been around the longest. Well, maybe not the longest, but it's, it's the most widely used. Uh, and you'll see it a lot. But there are some variants, or there are some others, uh, some general techniques called elliptic curve cryptography. Diffie-Hellman, we may see some examples of that. And there's something called the digital signature standard. Not all algorithms work for both confidentiality and authentication. RSA works for both. What's the difference here? Look at the difference. It's just the order of the keys. Okay? Confidentiality, public key to encrypt, private key to decrypt. Authentication, private key to encrypt, public key to decrypt. That's all that's different here. RSA algorithm allows that, allows you to use the keys in either order. Other algorithms, like the digital signature standard, do not allow that. So some are only used for digital signatures. Some are used, can also be used for encrypting for confidentiality. Uh, some, like Diffie-Hellman, are, are just used for exchanging secrets. But we will not see that until later, later in the semester. So there are several different algorithms for public key cryptography. Which one of these slides can we... Let's, let's look at this and see what it summarises. Some of the things we've already said. For public key cryptography, it should be easy to generate your key pair. Okay? You don't just randomly choose keys, you follow an algorithm to create a pair of keys. And so one requirement is that anyone can generate a key pair. And by easy, you can use some software to do it, and we'll do it as a homework task. You will one day, and you can generate it with software in a few seconds, generate a key pair. So that's possible. It should be easy to encrypt messages. Okay. This is a practical requirement. That is, uh, to encrypt using some key, say a public key of B, it should be fast. A few seconds, for example. It shouldn't take forever to do so. If you know the other key in the key pair, for example, if the message is encrypted with a public key of B, and you know the private key of B, so you are B, then it should be easy to decrypt. So again, just a practical requirement in that we need an algorithm such that we can do these things fast so that people will use it. The next two, four and five, are the security requirements. It should be hard, we say computationally infeasible, means that if we, it would take too long to do it, take forever to compute it. If you know the public key of B and you know the ciphertext, it should be practically impossible to find the private key of B. Okay, so we shouldn't be able to work back and find the private key of someone. But they are related. So the way that the keys are generated, they follow some steps. So there is an algorithm such that you generate the public and private key in a key pair. But it should be hard for someone knowing just one of them, the public key for example, to work out the private key. And the other requirement is that if we know a public key in the ciphertext, it should be hard to find the message. So it should be hard to decrypt if you don't have the private key, and it should be hard to find the private key. Those are the two basic requirements. And the algorithms like RSA and Diffie-Hellman are designed such that these requirements are met. And they're designed in such a way that to find the private key, given the public key, requires solving some computationally difficult mathematical operation. In terms of RSA, it involves factoring numbers into their primes. So any number can be written as a, a multiplication of a set of primes. Okay? So we talk about a number has factors, or a number has prime factors. And the RSA algorithm relies on the fact that for an attacker to find the private key, 
it would have to take some large number and find the prime factors of that. And it turns out that there are no known ways to do that in, in reasonable time. I'll show some statistics soon. But most of the public key algorithms depend upon solving complex mathematical operations. We will not have time to, to discuss them. Uh, there are a few slides on that. I know you're disappointed, so you, you, can discuss, you can read about them in your own time if you want to know how those algorithms work. Number six is just that some algorithms we'd like to be able to use the keys in opposite order. Encrypt with public key, decrypt with private key, or encrypt with private key, decrypt with public key. That's not a hard requirement. I think that will be about enough for public key. We can do brute force attacks, try and guess the key. How do we stop that? Make the key large enough. And there are other theoretical attacks on some of the algorithms, but in practice uh, not, not very efficient. This gives RSA. So RSA is a very widely used public key algorithm. It's described in these seven or eight lines of, of text. So that's the algorithm there. It looks simple but it turns out that it's very secure. But we will not cover how RSA works. RSA, but we'll say something about the, the security of it. RSA depends upon the difficulty of factoring a large number into its primes. Everyone remembers their primes? For example, factor uh, 24 into its primes. What's the answer? What are the prime factors of 24? Hmm. 24. The numbers which we multiply, the prime numbers which we multiply together, that gives us 24. So what is it? Uh, 2 times 2 times 2 times 3 gives us 24. 2 and 3 are primes. So with RSA we usually need to factor one number into its two prime factors. For example, um, what are the prime factors of 35? 7 and 5. 7 and 5 are both primes. So the challenge there is given 35, find, find the prime factors. That's easy. With RSA, given a very large number Instead of 35, a number which is 1,000 bits long, for example, or 2,000 bits long, find the prime factors, and there are no known ways to do that fast. So people have done some, some tests, for example, in 2009, given a number which is 232 digits long, not 35, but a large number, that's the length if we write it down, in 2009, it took uh, something like 2,000 uh, processing years on, on a single computer to factor that into its primes. Of course, they didn't use a single computer. They used many computers. But that was some measure of the difficulty it takes to factor a large number into its primes. So nowadays, we measure RSA by the length of this large number that we need to factor into primes. So when you use RSA, you'll see mentions to 1,024 bits, 2,048 bits, and so on. And it turns out that taking a number of that length and finding the prime factors is not possible. And that's why RSA is considered secure. You don't need to know about why that's the case, but just to be aware, when you use RSA, usually you need to choose a key length. And it will be one of those three values, 1,024, 2,048, 4,096. The larger the value, the more secure. But usually the, the, less, uh, the less well it performs. The problem with public key cryptography compared to symmetric key is it's much slower to encrypt. Have we done a speed test before? OpenSSL is some encryption software. I can do a speed test. What's a symmetric key cipher? 
common quiz or exam question, not know how the ciphers work, but be aware of some of the popular ones. What's a symmetric key cipher we've mentioned? The abbreviation, a symmetric key cipher. If you don't know, look through your slides. In fact, what is a symmetric key cipher, the name of one? One of the widely used symmetric key ciphers, or one of the original ones. Again, what is it? AES. Okay, that's the widely used symmetric key cipher, the advanced encryption standard. Uh, it, I can use a 128-bit key, which is sort of one of the basic ones. Let's see if this works. This just runs a speed test where my software goes away and encrypts or decrypts many blocks per second. And I'll stop it there. It, in this case, for over three seconds, it encrypted 11 million blocks of random plain text. So in three seconds, it does 11, let's approximately say about 12 million encryptions in three seconds about 4 million per second. So my computer can encrypt using a symmetric key cipher about 4 million blocks per second. It's hard to compare but I'll just give a, an indication. If we use RSA, and I made a mistake, I'll just type RSA, speed test with a public key cipher. Which one is faster? Now it's doing RSA encryption. With it goes for 10 seconds. I'll stop it there so we don't have to wait. For example, in this case, using the private key, so encrypting with a private key, which is authentication, it could do what? 100,000 in 10 seconds. 100,000 encryptions in 10 seconds is about 10,000 encryptions in one second. So with RSA, and it's not a direct comparison, but about 10,000 encryptions in one second. With AES, with AES in one second it does about 4 million, 3.5 or 4 million encryptions per second. It did 11 million in three seconds, which is almost 4 million in one second. So there's the difference. RSA about 10,000 per second, AES about 4 million per second. So this is just demonstrating that symmetric key ciphers are much, much faster than public key ciphers. And that has an impact on where we use them. Again, you cannot use those numbers directly to compare, but as an indicator of performance, so it's okay. The point is that public key cryptography we cannot use to encrypt large amounts of data because it's too slow. And hence it's widely used in encrypting for signatures. Remember a signature we encrypt just the hash value, only a small amount of data. So it's okay for that, but encrypting large files we generally don't use public key cryptography. I mean, it, it can be used, but it, it's too slow. You might as well just use symmetric key cryptography for large files. And in practice, what happens is that symmetric key cryptography is used for data encryption, large amounts of data. Public key cryptography is used for signatures or encrypting small amounts of data. And a small amount of data that we often want to encrypt is a secret key used by symmetric key cryptography. Remember with symmetric key cryptography, both users need to know a shared secret key. I choose a random number, 256 bits, and I give it to you. And we have a shared secret key. But one of our problems was, how do I get that secret key to you across a network? How do I send you a secret? Anyone? An idea? Encrypt it with what? Hash doesn't provide encryption. Let's have a look. 
come back to symmetric key ciphers, and I think this will be the last thing that we need really in this topic. Virtual private network encrypts data with a key, so you need a key up front. So our problem again, A and B want to communicate using symmetric key encryption. A chooses a key. Let's say it creates a random key, KAB. Before it can send data encrypted using that key, it needs to send the key to B. How does it do so? Of course, we cannot send it in plain text because someone could intercept the key and therefore uh, it's no longer secret. So a common way to do it, the concept is to obtain the public key of B. So now let's combine symmetric and, and, and public key crypto, crypto. We encrypt using the public key of B, KAB, and send that to B. Encrypting using the destination's public key is providing confidentiality with public key crypto. I send that to B, B decrypts, and they get KAB. So this is, say, the ciphertext. See, we send that to B, B decrypts. The received value with what key? B will decrypt with their own private key and they'll get as an output KAB. Now we have a shared secret key between A and B. And now when we want to send data, we switch to using symmetric key encryption. So now we have a message to send Subsequent data we encrypt using a symmetric key cipher. Uh, we should have denoted what ciphers were used here. This black one was using, for example, RSA. And now we use an alternative, for example, We encrypt using KAB our message, the data we want to communicate. And in this case, we'd use a symmetric key cipher, for example, AES. And then when we decrypt, we use a shared secret key. So in fact, we do it in two steps. Exchange a secret using public key cryptography, then exchange data using symmetric key cryptography. And we take advantage of both of their advantages. That is, the advantage of symmetric key cryptography is it's fast. So when we have a lot of data, either at many messages or large messages, encrypting them with symmetric key crypto like AES is much faster than using public key crypto. The advantage of public key cryptography is that we can encrypt something using a key without having to obtain that key via some secret medium. A encrypted the shared secret key using the public key of B. So as long as we know the public key of B, this works. So that's a common way in which both ciphers are used. Correct. RSA is an example of public key cryptography. AES is an example of symmetric key cryptography. Encrypt a secret using RSA. Encrypt your data using AES. And keep, if you have more data to send, you can keep using the symmetric key cryptography. So just use the 
public key crypto for key exchange, really. Exchange a secret. Any questions on that approach? Correct. Exchange a key with a, using public key cryptography. Once you have that key, then encrypt your data using symmetric key cryptography. So that's a common way that the different types are used. So let's, to finish this topic, we'll, there's three more after public key crypto. The key management and random numbers we'll say very briefly about signatures we've covered. So we've already jumped to them. So we'll finish that in the next five or ten minutes. So we can move on next week. Some assumptions so far about public key crypto. A pair of keys. One used for encryption, one for decryption. Think every user has their key pair. So one of your homework tasks will be to generate your own key pair. Everyone can generate their own key pair. Encrypt. Encrypting with one key in the key pair produces ciphertext. You can only successfully decrypt with the other key in that same key pair. That's our assumption. If we decrypt with the wrong key, we'll be able to recognize that. So there are some assumptions we've used so far. What about the last topics? Key management is this issue of how do we get keys to each other? And we just saw an example. This is one example of key management, a very simple example. How do I get the secret between A and B? Use public key crypto. But with this one, how does A learn the public key of B? That's another challenge. And there are ways to try and exchange keys, exchange keys in an automatic way across a network. And we will not go through them. We will see more detailed example of key management when we look at web security and digital certificates. But it's about how do you share a secret key? We just saw one example. How do you obtain someone else's public key? Sounds obvious, just tell them. But how are you sure it's not someone pretending to be someone else? And another aspect of key management is when to change keys. Like, when do you change passwords? How often should you change passwords? A similar concept applies. How often should you change your keys? Don't use the same secret key forever. Okay, so there are some guidelines of when to change and how to automatically change. But I'll not go through them. We'll assume for, for now on that, that we can somehow exchange a secret key without someone else learning the value of that secret key and that we can obtain the correct public key. Okay, that we've got means to do that. Digital signatures, we've seen, we've mentioned that, uh, well, we didn't mention this. The aim is to prove to, to anyone that once we have a message that it came from a particular user. Now, be careful. Symmetric key cryptography cannot be used for a digital signature. In symmetric key cryptography, how many people have a secret key? If I have KAB, then there's someone else that has KAB. So with symmetric key cryptography, two people have that key. With public key cryptography, only one person in the world has the private key. So we can use that for a signature because it's proof to others that a signed message came from that one person. We can't do that with symmetric key cryptography because what could happen is that Let's say I encrypt a message with a shared secret key, KAB. And then someone has a copy of this message. Maybe the hash is encrypted with KAB. And we later need to prove to others that it came from user A. 
Okay? We need to prove for some, some legal reasons that this message came from user A. There's no way to prove to anyone that it came from A. The message, if it was encrypted with a secret key KAB, could have came from A or B, because both A and B have the secret. So in symmetric key cryptography, because two people know the secret, there is no way to prove that that message came from just one person. It could have come from two in the world. With public key cryptography, only one person in the world has the private key, so that forms as a way to prove that a message comes from that one person. So we only use public key cryptography for signatures. We went through these operations. In general, the concept is we encrypt using your private key. In practice, we encrypt the hash of a message using your private key to obtain a signature. And we decrypt with a public key to verify that signature. There are different algorithms for signatures. RSA can be used. There's one called the Digital Signature Algorithm, DSA, and a few variants. So some are listed there. And different hash algorithms are used. So remember, we have a hash algorithm here. Which one to use? SHA is common. So the assumptions we'll make from now on. A digital signature is the encrypted hash value of a message where the key we use is a private key of some user. And once we receive a digital signature, we can verify it using the public key. This last topic, random numbers, we'll see throughout different security mechanisms, we use random numbers for different reasons. We've seen already, I've said generate a secret key, choose a random value. Well, it should be truly random. It turns out for computers to generate random numbers is not easy. How do you generate a random number on your computer? How can you generate a random number? What, type it in from your head? Call the RAND function, okay. How is the RAND function implemented? If, right, so the random, so there's usually some random function provided by a library of a different programming language, and one characteristic of those random functions is you can usually specify an input. It's called a seed to specify uh, some um, mode of the, the algorithm to use. How, but how is that implemented? The computer has some code that implements the random function, but remember it's just some deterministic set of code that we can work out. Uh, it just creates a value of following some algorithm. So it's not truly random, because it's following some steps that we can in fact predict what would happen. It's very hard to generate random numbers which are what we call truly random because a computer just follows steps that we program it to do which is not really random. It's something that is deterministic. A good way to generate random numbers is to, I think I have it here, is to measure some non-deterministic source. Measure radiation from the atmosphere or different devices and it's believe generally that they are very close to random in that they generate variations which we can consider random. Measure some noise generated from electronics or, or circuits or maybe some operations on computer hardware so that those events follow some randomness and they are considered so if you buy hardware that does these things they can be referred to as true random number generators. But not many people have such hardware in their computer to, to measure radiation, for example. So in fact, when we talk about random numbers, the RAND function in your computer, it's really a pseudo-random number generator. It's not truly random. It pretends to be random. But we're not going to cover the details of that. That is, we're going to assume that the random number generators that we have available 
can generate effectively true random number generators, uh, random numbers. It turns out in practice, many of the flaws in cryptography come down to poor random numbers, badly chosen random numbers. There have been some substantial attacks based upon weakness in random number generators. But no time to cover that in this course. We've gone through symmetric key cryptography, generally used for file encryption or encryption of data across a network. Two examples are AES and triple DES, an extension of DES. We've gone through public key cryptography. And it's mainly used for key exchange or digital signatures, authenticating the source. And there's some examples, there's RSA, there's Diffie-Hellman and a few others. We skipped over, but we may have quickly mentioned there's MAC functions used for authentication, but we focused on hash functions used for authentication. We saw some examples of using MD5 or SHA. Usually, public key crypto is combined with hash functions to produce digital signatures, which we've just covered. Random numbers are very important. And the algorithms for creating random numbers are very important. Uh, but for our course, we will not cover how they work. Let's finish with this slide. This just lists some principles that we'll see throughout the course. Some we've mentioned, some we'll, we'll come across again. Some principles that we'll often talk about with respect to cryptographic algorithms is that experience is important. That is, algorithms that have been used for a long time are generally considered less likely to have problems than new algorithms. Okay, so someone designs a new cipher, a new version which they say is more secure than AES, faster than AES. Generally in, in cryptography we'd like to see some experience of using that cipher before we really believe it's more secure and faster. That's why you often see that systems use algorithms which are quite old, 10, 20 years old in some cases, because people are not so trustworthy of new systems until they've really been tested a lot. So that's something that comes up. With respect to performance, we, it's almost always the case that symmetric key algorithms are much faster than public key. So if you want to encrypt something, a lot of data, use symmetric key algorithms. Uh, most algorithms, the more data we encrypt, the longer it will take. And there's a linear relationship between the, the time and the size of the data. You encrypt a file which is one megabyte and it takes two seconds. Therefore, we assume you encrypt a file which is two megabytes, it will take four seconds. Okay, so as you increase the data size, you'll increase the time. We didn't talk much about it, but one principle we'll use is that if you use secret keys, you should change them quite often. Do not reuse the same key forever. Similar to passwords. If you use a password, in theory, you should change it quite often to reduce the chance that an attacker can discover that password. The same is for keys. And with keys, if you want to give a key to someone else, we need automatic ways to do that. We cannot say, write the key on a piece of paper and deliver it to them. That doesn't work in large networks. So we need protocols and automatic means to distribute keys. We cannot rely on manual means. Last thing, which will come out through the course, multi-layer security re refers to using different, multiple security mechanisms to increase the security of a system. Don't just use one system or one security mechanism and rely on that. Use one and then maybe on top of that use another security mechanism and build them up such that if one has a flaw, then you have the backups of the others. And we'll see that as we go through some different topics. If you want to explore some other areas, look at those topics. What we'll do next week is look at the topic of what? What's next? Someone remind me.
authentication. Authenticating not computers, but humans, I think is the next topic. Passwords. How do we make sure that a human is who they say they are? 